It's 8 a.m. on a cold November morning on I-40. I'm a thousand miles from home, flying down the highway, freezing my butt off in a vintage race car with a cigar-chomping good old boy at the helm. The windshield is icing over, and we're following another guy who thinks driving 16 hours a day is normal. And I was the one who gladly signed on for this trip. What was I thinking? It was a beautiful November day when I found myself riding shotgun in Ralph Button's Factory 5 Roadster, heading west on I-40 out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Our destination, Las Vegas, Nevada, to attend the 2003 Factory 5 Nationals. But Ralph wasn't going to simply drive to Vegas just so he could watch the Factory 5 Nationals. Oh no, true to his storied reputation, he was going to drive in them as well. I tend to be a little crazier in that rather than have a trailer, um, I will load my car up with my tools that I need and go to any track event. Unload the trunk and go out and play and have fun. Now there's an old adage that goes something like, don't street your race car and don't race your street car, but don't tell that to Ralph Button. As the sun hung low on one of those perfect mild autumn afternoons, the prospects of the trip were exciting. Plus, I'd be heading out with a famous Factory 5 racing customer who is affectionately known as the Traveler. I built my car in 1998. I really wanted to build it to find out, could I build a car? So what started out as what I call my Henry Ford syndrome, can I build a car? quickly turned into something different where once I get in the car and sit down in it and start it up, it's like, where can I go today? And the where can I go is not just down the street. It is, I wonder where this road goes to. Two, three, four hundred miles later, I find where that road went to and then I start back home again. As of today, I have 1,000 999,760 miles on my car. Ralph's nickname, The Traveler, is accurate, but it barely does him justice. Should be more like Traveler Maximus, I think. How much? 124 miles. How many more to go? Many. <laughs> many. A couple hours after leaving Raleigh, we pull in for our first of many gas stops. We also meet up with our other traveling companion, Earl Gross, driving his yellow Factory 5 Roadster. Now, Earl is also a legendary character in Factory 5 lore. Now, he makes a little money by selling aftermarket parts for these cars while making a huge amount of friends with his wit, kindness, and genuine personality. Are you done? we take the opportunity to enjoy a fine dining experience before hitting the road again. A great food, good companions, beautiful weather, and our thundering V8 powered Factory 5 Roadsters getting thumbs up from everyone we pass. Life doesn't get much better. Alright, so maybe I lied a little bit about the food. Our first night, and we're just outside Knoxville, Tennessee, when we hit our first traffic jam. But still, it's a beautiful evening and the cars are running well. We stop for the night in Jackson, Tennessee after putting nearly 600 miles under our belt. Not a bad day's run, considering we didn't even leave Raleigh until noon. Six a.m. comes awfully early. I'm still rubbing the sleep out of my eyes, and Earl is, well, he's Earl. How are you feeling this morning, Earl? Remarkable mumbling. <laughs> Nose well mumbled. Ralph has already been up and had his breakfast and fixed a bulky antenna for his GPS device on his car. There's got to be something wrong with this man. 
It is uh, 620 here here in Jackson, Tennessee. And we have officially 1,661 miles to go is all. What? By the airplane. That's what the GPS says. <laughs> time to hit the road again. Today, I decide to ride with Earl. Nothing against Ralph, but Earl has installed a bigger passenger foot box in his car, which means my feet have more room. Now, these cars aren't really known for their creature comforts, so hey, I'll take anything I can get. We continue to get a lot of thumbs up from other drivers as we make our way west. It's always nice to be noticed. And these cars get you noticed more than if we were riding Harley's naked. Oh, that's, that's a bad mental picture. Now, let, let, let's not go there. Now, our trip was going to be a pretty straight shot down I-40 to Kingman, Arizona, then north into Las Vegas. And it's pretty easy to navigate, I would think. I mean, really, three guys with a GPS device and road maps? Hey, we don't need no stinking directions. I still don't know what happened, but eventually we find our way back on the highway heading in the right direction. It was too good to last. The weather, I mean. First the sky turned dark, then the rain came. Ralph and Earl usually don't bother to put up the tops in a little rain, but this storm was different. I mean, I don't mind rain, but I do mind when the rain comes down so bad that the inside of your windshield is wetter than the outside of your windshield. The tops go on the cars and we continue on our way. Nightfall finds us in Oklahoma City and the temperature starts to drop. I mean, plummet. Despite the chill, Ralph and Earl still take time to talk to the locals about our cars. We press on into the darkness. We cross into Texas where we stop for the night. And I'm hoping it'll be a bit warmer in the morning. Hope springs eternal. All right, Ralph, what's the temperature out? It's got to be 34, 36 degrees and dropping fast. Well, so much for eternal springing hope. Texas lets us know that winter is on the doorstep. It looks like another cold day with temperatures in the low 30s. And Ralph is originally from Maine, but for us good old boys from down south, temperatures in the 30s is downright cold. Ralph, on the other hand, seems to be doing just fine. Well, I later learn what his secret is. Actually, I was very comfortable through the entire trip. I have a heater and a defroster in my car. And um, in preparation for this trip, because I'd heard that some of the tempers might be a little on the low side, uh, I um, disconnected the passenger side heat and directed it towards the uh, driver's side. As a result, even when it was mid and low 20s, I could drive along without my jacket on and just my um, long sleeve shirt on in the car and feel very comfortable. Hmm, I wonder if Earl did the same thing and didn't tell me. We press on into the rush hour traffic in Amarillo, Texas. And if the freezing air wasn't bad enough, we now have to cope with ice on the road. An early morning accident is testament to the treacherous conditions. When Earl and Ralph are cautious drivers, and amazingly, the cars handle the roads without incident. Still, as I watch ice forming on the wind wings and windshield, I gotta wonder if it's going to get any colder. Leaving Amarillo, we see a sight that would bring a smile to any historic car aficionado. A whole truckload of vintage Corvettes. I couldn't help but smile at the irony though. I mean, here we are in two vintage replicas that together have clocked more than 200,000 miles, while the Corvettes suffer the indignity of being trailered to their destination. 
Crossing into New Mexico, we pull in for gas in a little out of the way town where we come across a section of highway that played a major role in American history, Route 66. And it seems the locals are Ford fans as well. As if on cue, the sun comes out and the weather clears. And the air is still crisp when we stop for lunch, but the clear skies help Ralph decide to take his top off, uh, his car top that is. And this weather must seem like summertime in Maine to Ralph. Earl and I decide it's still a little bit too nippy for our delicate southern cheeks, so our top stays on. As we cross the border into Arizona, we decide to take a little break from driving, stretch our legs, and you know, act like tourists for a while. We find this place and couldn't resist taking a look around. This sign is definitely Earl. Back outside, Ralph uses the time to replace a burned out light bulb while Earl takes a few pictures. And finally, it's time to hit the road again. A gorgeous western sunset finds us outside of Flagstaff on our way to Kingman, Arizona. There's something about the air out west, especially at altitude, that makes for killer sunsets. The cars have performed well and our spirits are high as we end day three. Day four arrives, and for the first time, we all sleep in a little later. We're only a short drive from our final destination, and Earl is eager to get going. He wants to have plenty of time to set up his wares at the racetrack, so Ralph and I bid him goodbye. Ralph and I head up to Mr. D's, a famous burger joint in Kingman where we plan on meeting up with the Arizona Factory 5 group who will escort us the rest of the way to Vegas. One by one, the group arrives and cars begin to fill the parking lot. It's great to see so many Factory 5 cars and so many familiar faces. I spot Paul Gillespie, who I had met the year before when I was filming at Bob Bondurant School in Phoenix. I decide to hitch a ride with Paul on our final leg of the trip. Arriving at Hoover Dam, we must have made quite a sight. Ralph takes stock of our trip to date. Right. Held up well. One light bulb on the left side, one crack. Wing, wind wing. And, uh, one, and whose fault was that? The uh, schmucky driver. <laughs> and one um, blower belt that finally quit after about 120,000 miles and finally gave up. Yeah, so, other than that, everything else is done well. No problems. Just keeps humming along. After three and a half days of riding in three different Factory 5 Roadsters with more than 2,300 miles behind me, I have finally arrived. Early the next morning, I team back up with Ralph and we make our way to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, site of the 2003 Factory 5 Nationals. I asked Ralph if maybe it was just a little crazy to drive cross country and then run his car on a track. My um, plan always in the back of my mind is if I have a problem, if something strange happens, then I'll find the nearest U-Haul place, get a trailer, throw it on the trailer, haul it home with the truck and be done with it and fix it up. What has amazed me constantly and has amazed probably others is that I can come to a track event, drive the track event so aggressively and still be able to drive the car home. It's not like I go to the track event and take it easy and kind of take slow laps around. Most of the guys who have seen me on the track events will see that I'll drive as aggressively as I can. Now we get to go play on the autocross track. 
I don't baby the car at the open track events. And that's probably a testament to two factors. One is the kind of car that Factory 5 was offering us. They were offering us a car that was really lightweight, aluminum and really well-made chassis and a very lightweight body, and using components that were designed for a much heavier weight car, for a Mustang. Basic engine is still the original block from when I built the car in 1998. How's the tires? Uh, fast down into the 20s. There's one guy in the 23s. Uh, there's a couple tires. other guys in the 20s. No, those are street. Street tires? Yeah. What do I got to get down to? 23.2. You can do it. I can get two more seconds you can out get of it. it. Smoother was better. Exactly. Good job, Ralph. After a full day of open track and several autocross runs, it's time to head back to the hotel and the awards dinner. Ralph is obviously eager to see if his autocross time will hold up and if he'll go home with a trophy. But even if he doesn't win, he still made an impressive showing, especially in a car with nearly 200,000 miles on the odometer. In sixth place is the Traveler, Ralph Button. Right. Ralph takes home a sixth place trophy for his efforts. But his evening is not over yet. Once a year we recognize an outstanding person with what we call the Factory 5 Legacy Award. And that award is given to the person who has made the greatest contribution to our, our sport and our community. So, anyway, uh, we have a legacy award this year. The person doesn't know about it. He was mentioned previously. His car is slightly out of warranty. Ralph Button, come on up here. The biggest surprise was the legacy award that I got. As um, Dave Smith was describing the award, it was like, I didn't know who he was going to give it to. And he was describing who it had been given to before. People like Dick Smith, um, Bob Bondurant. And then for him to say my name in the same group, because I've now received that award, that probably was the biggest shock. And I was still kind of numb that they actually wanted to give that award to me. Um, that probably meant the most to me from any of the other trophies I've ever gotten for anything. Ralph now stands proud among the other Legacy Award recipients. This award is only given to those who symbolize the spirit behind the Factory 5 Roadster. And I think Ralph Button certainly qualifies in this regard. For me, my journey is over. But Ralph Button still has many miles to go before his trip is finished and he's back home again. Ralph plans to leave Las Vegas and drive to San Francisco, then turn around and head back cross country to North Carolina. I asked Ralph about his future plans. In the far distant reaches, it is possible that you may find me one day making a drive up to Alaska. I don't doubt for a minute that someday the Traveler and his Blue Roadster will be heading up the Alcan Highway. After all, all he has to do is point his car north and turn up the heater. <laughs>